beyond the realm of man Until we've thoroughly tested every last close-chested view Find the more you think you know, the less you really do Where would we be without THC? We know the lying to us, just don't know to what degree Where would we be without THC? The highest side chat Carl Wood and Company Here we go, higher side chatters. It seems that by now we've noticed the world is not the random chaos they'd have us believe it is, but a complex network of unseen energies and forces waxing and waning as their influences inspire events and actions like conductors behind the curtain. And in this reality of synchronicity and spiritual sway, one of the aspects a person should familiarize themselves with is the path of the almighty planets as they dance around the celestial sphere. We're aware the ancients saw value in the great grandfather clock in the sky, the elite have consulted with oracles and astrologers probably more than we already know, and a person can gain valuable insight from examining their own chart and how it relates to the ongoing changes in the configuration. So when we transition to a new year, it's always advantageous to take the time to look back at the trails we blazed and look forward for insights into what might come next. To do that, I'd like to check in with the best astrologer I know, Austin Kopic. You've heard him here twice before, and I'm psyched to hear what's on Earth's agenda going forward. The space weather watcher extraordinaire, the great path predictor and planetary personality profiler, my friend and yours, Austin. Welcome back to the higher side. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. Always a treat. So let's talk about last year a bit to get the wheels greased. Yeah. I think it's a good way to get started. And as we kind of look back at what the forecast was for 2017 versus the reality, how did the map seem to match the territory? What are your thoughts on what we saw in the year of the firecock, which I thought was an appropriately named year, to say the least? <laughs> yeah, indeed, right? Well, on a general thematic level, the primary thing that I wrote about and thought about for 2017 was the superabundance of planets in fire signs. And I expected the year to, I don't know, have the character of, I don't know, what, what do they call it? Not a triathlon, a decathlon, where it's kind of exhausting and the event keeps changing. It's this game and that game, and now you're doing archery, now you're running a mile, et cetera, et cetera. And I also expected a lot of, what is it, sound and fury signifying nothing, a lot of smoke, but you couldn't quite tell where the fire actually was. There obviously were fires, but you know, it was much more wreathed in smoke. And that sort of constant outrage and upset without a whole lot of events of consequence happening. You know, there were a few things that I think happened that we'll remember in 2017, about 2017. But if you think about the amount of upset and outrage, the amount of emotional energy spent worrying about things, there wasn't, <laughs> it didn't, didn't quite match the actual events. And so that was that was very much as expected. I was really interested to see what happened during that big old solar eclipse. Right. right. Because that was I believe we talked about that at the beginning of 2017 or maybe it was the end of 2016. And I was like, oh, that's that's very interesting. You know, that's a point in the timeline to triple underline. And then as we got closer to it, everybody was talking about it. I got so hyped up and I was just like. I just wanted to see what would actually happen, <laughs> right? You can, only, you can only think and talk about things so much ahead of time. And so it was really interesting to see what happened. I would say the first thing that actually happened was that in the two weeks after the eclipse, the United States, uh, portions of the United States were assaulted by fire and flood, yeah. right? destruction by fire and water. And I'm here in Southern Oregon and so not only did I see the eclipse, but I think a day or two after the skies became choked with ash and smoke to the degree that the afternoon sun just looked like a dull red through the haze and the air smelled like destruction. And that that was two weeks solid of that. 
I believe where I am, we had the worst air quality in the nation for several days in a row. <laughs> mm. And, you know, meanwhile, you know, other parts of the United States are getting buffeted by hurricanes. And that was interesting because that was, I guess, you know, I was so focused on the human and cultural impact of the eclipse that I forgot that sometimes these things are extremely literal. <laughs> right. right. It's like, you know, the dark sun slices through the United States and then there's destruction. That's almost more, you know, it's so literal. It takes us back to like Babylonian omen reading or something. You know, when when the sun and moon are eclipsed in this place, then, you know, there shall be destruction in the land. Oh, and if, yeah. if, if you'd come at it from what's almost like a cartoonish prophetic angle, you would have been dead on. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's funny because we did have the northwest corner on fire, the southeast corner blasted with floods, like you said. And I even did a show right in that time frame about dozens of strange owl men winged humanoid sightings in Chicago right there in the middle of the country. So I was just like, man, all along that path, we got heightened activity going on, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's a as far as Alman activity or people seeing creatures that probably don't exist or don't exist in exactly the same way that we exist, that sort of veil shearing is something that's very common to eclipse season for whatever reasons. Eclipses seem to sort of connect the visible and the invisible or the apparent and the latent sort of like opens a portal there. Yeah. And so you get things changing faster. A lot of times you'll see on a personal level, if there's something you've been thinking about for a while and you're like, you can kind of, you know, when you look back on it, you could see that change coming for a while. But during a little eclipse season, that change will suddenly emerge fully formed. You're like, oh, I'm ready to do this differently or I'm ready to stop doing this or I'm ready to start doing this. But that also happens outside of an individual psyche and it's also you know they're they're weird and occulty yeah. oh yeah <laughs> externally it's just weird both in the w-e-i-r-d and the w-y-r-d senses indeed yeah so there was the extremely obvious disaster component of that and then culturally it was very surreal to in the middle of that eclipse season see the marchers in Charlottesville, some of them doing a neo-Nazi thing or however you want to, whatever terms people want to use for that. But literally like it's the waving the flag of the black sun, right? It's like the black sun is coming up and then you have people doing that publicly. It's like, that's bizarre. And <laughs> what's, what's even stranger to me is the particular Deccan or which is a third of a sign where that solar eclipse occurred is a decan that I, I chose to represent symbolically as a banner or a flag in my work, looking over past images and trying to summarize them. And like literally seeing the black, basically the black sun on a flag was again, shockingly literal. <laughs> so there's that. And so what's interesting is with eclipses, the traditional predictive framework for eclipses is that for a solar eclipse, it gets six months to show you everything that it has in store. And since eclipses occur roughly every six months, it's basically that particular eclipse is valid until you get the next solar eclipse, right? So we're at the very tail end of that right now. We've got about three weeks to go. And so there was the fact that this eclipse was right on top of Trump's sun, right? Yes. Which is, you know, just as an astrologer, if that's your client, you're like, oh boy, <laughs> I got hit pretty hard for that because just people in my regular life, I was spouting off quite a bit about the Great American Eclipse and this indication that it was spelling out a career change in Trump's chart. And I was about to make dozens of conventional folks see the power of astrology like they'd never seen. And now they laugh at me, Austin. What happened? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so part of it is... You know, you can look at something like that and you could say, well, this is the kind of thing that happens a lot of the time. As much as I would love it if astrology was 100 percent or let's say my ability to look at astrology allowed me to be 100 percent about everything, that would be great. Not that that's not and is never going to be the case. 
you know, even if theoretically there is a, a perfect astrology, right? You then have to wonder whether human beings are capable of doing that. <laughs> but so one of the things that was interesting about the Trump administration during that period of time is that's when Bannon got let go. Hmm. And so that is a significant moment for that administration. True. It's not Trump being impeached, right? Which is a little, I was talking with Gordon about this and he's like, no, no, that was a really significant shift and not a good one for Trump. And I was like, yeah, that's fair. But when we look at the precedents for this eclipse cycle, so eclipses come around in more or less the same place every 18.6 years, and there'll be a band of about 18 months where they're in the same pair of signs, right? And so when we look back at this one, this particular cycle, this cycle is very hard on leaders in the United States. The last time we were doing this cycle was when Bill Clinton got impeached. And the time before that was when Reagan got shot. Wow. And you can go, yeah, and you can go back through the 20th century. And almost every time we get this cycle, you have really hard times for whoever is in office, right? And the types of events are different, but they're almost always really obvious. And so anyway, Gordon and I were talking about this and he's like, well, you know, that was that was a, a significant shift in the Trump administration. And I was like, and that's fair. But the pattern for this eclipse, this series is usually not something that you have to think about. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And just because something usually does something doesn't mean that it will 100 percent all the time do it. You know, 80 percent is worth considering. Yeah. I mean, Gordon always says magic is a probability enhancer. So obviously that doesn't mean a hundred percent, but your chances are incredibly heightened within a certain time frame for something to happen. Yeah. 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 But anyways, that was a little surprising. We're also in this eclipse, the same eclipse cycle that's hard on American leadership for another year. So we'll see. Ah, I mean, ahead of time, if I were going to guess that something like obvious would happen to the president. I would have guessed it was it would have been in the six months following the eclipse that was on the on his ascendant. But I don't you know, again, these <laughs> it's not an exact science. Yeah. Well, you know, you can get a probability where you're like, mm, I think it's going to be then it's worth betting on. Right. It's where are the odds as in many things. Trump is really distracting. Right. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not worth considering, but it's important to not let that guy suck up all your attention. And I think one of the things that I didn't think about enough because Trump is so distracting is that if you look at what are the traditional significations for a total eclipse occurring over the body of a country, sure, it's leaders, but it's also like there's this, it's like this fourth century text which says basically like the common people need fear and eclipse far less than those who are in, you know, positions of kingship and nobility, you know, people who are highly ranked in that country. That's, that's what the eclipse, that's what a solar eclipse signifies is the downfall of people who are normally in, in bright, radiant positions. Right. And so, you know, not too long you know, once we got a month or two out of that eclipse, then we started seeing people falling from the sky, right? Beginning with Weinstein, but then there's been a cascade of, of meteoric falls since then. And I was like, oh, well, that was right there. You know, that's right there with like the literally you just read the read the book. It says, OK, people in high positions, they will fall in the six months following, you know, an eclipse over a country like this. And, it, you know, it was just right there. You could also tie that into politics because, yeah, we saw all these people falling in Hollywood. But also, I can't remember a presidential administration that had so many firings. I mean, those are positions of kingship. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, or nobility. Dude, if you're in the court of the king. You're under the eye of the eclipse. Well, and so Gordon and I were talking about this and it's like, well, you know what? Maybe. So if you look at the cultures from which we get these celestial omens, right? Like an eclipse as an attack on the king, right? And those who are royal, you know, we're, we're back in Mesopotamia. We're back in Babylon, right? 
You can find it other places, but it is in particular Mesopotamia that gives what people call Western astrology, you know, about 60% of its DNA. (laughs) And so they, you know, when they had omens like that, it wasn't like the king sat around and was like, okay, I guess I'm fucked, right? There are methods. You figure out what the probabilities are, and if they're terrible for you, then you move around that. Right. And so, you know, kind of the oldest trick in the book is the dummy king sacrifice. You make somebody else king for a day and then you get rid of them. Wow. Or, you know, you get rid of the people around you. You know, you sacrifice other people to, you know, to appease the dire gods above. (laughs) And so, again, it's the oldest trick in the book when you see an omen like that. And so, you know, it's symbolic substitution. And so to a certain degree, I think Bannon works in that capacity. But I don't know. I don't know if that's sort of an accidental solve or atropaic solution for the king in this case. Or, you know, as the world increasingly reveals its strangeness, you know, who knows? Maybe there are people who understand that, who want Trump in power for now. Right. Who are like, okay, so we're going to do this. And that's going to keep you where we want you. Absolutely possible. It is just a little bit frustrating because I think there's definitely power in this stuff. But yet the skeptics in my life, they would probably interpret this conversation as fudging the data to make the prediction fit. But it's like, what can you do? These aren't exact things and, and they are just kind of waves of energy and they manifest in different ways, but it's like you either think there's value in it or you don't. And it's really hard to point to things that are like clockwork and say, well, here's the proof, at least from their perspective. Yeah. And I think that's fair. I I think my experience of astrology was that the more I examined it, the more satisfied the skeptical part of me was. Oh, yeah. And because I, I thought I was fucking garbage <laughs> when I was younger. And I was just shocked that it worked at all. And then I learned more and it worked better, et cetera, et cetera. And there was actually a cliche in the astrological community where half of the half of the professional astrologers started out in astrology by trying to debunk it, but try to debunk it seriously, which means to study it and study how it works and what the methods are, and then compare that to what happens and what people are like, and they end up affirming it. And of course, most of that's done on a personal level, which is different than doing the astrology of history. But that is a a very common thing, again, common enough to be a cliche. And I sympathize with that. There was a book, I think, on Raja Yoga that I read when I was 19. And I don't remember anything about it except for this one paragraph. And the paragraph basically said, don't argue with the skeptical, critical evidence requiring part of yourself. Don't try to don't try to just turn that off. Just acknowledge that that's going to be there and that there's a part of you that's going to need to see the data stack up before it's going to shut up. And that that part isn't always right. It's not automatically right or wrong. It's just that part of the mind and that it's better to investigate and satisfy (laughs) that that part, you know, give it give it its due. But also remember that it's not automatically correct. Yeah, I mean, makes sense. It's also my favorite way to hear that conspiracy researchers got on to certain topics is first by being like, there's no way this is possible. 9-11 was not an inside job. Let me dig into this data so that I can prove it. And then you come out on the other side and you're writing a book called Where Did the Towers Go? And you're now the head of the conspiracy rabbit hole. So, I mean, I like that when people try to debunk things and they end up coming out the other side. I think that's really the best way to get into something rather than just being naive and assuming it works when you really haven't vetted it properly. Right. Well, and I would say that until you've gotten into the gears of something, especially with astrology, what does it mean that it works? Right. Like you need to, to a certain degree, you need to see how it works to know what to expect as an output from that machine. True. Right. Like can astrology 
predict everything that's going to happen exactly? Absolutely not, right? That would suggest that human beings have no capacity for meaningful choice, right? Are there some things that get predicted bang on? Oh, yeah, just look at the history. <laughs> but can everything be predicted? No, right? You know, and then you get into, and so let's just say that you validate astrology and you get to the point where you're like, okay, this is definitely worth taking into consideration. And then let's say, you know, again, let's say you're the king and there's a, a solar eclipse coming up and you're like, hmm, what can I do about that? Right. And that's an incredible like that's a, a question that occurs naturally. If you're like, oh, there's an ill wind blowing in exactly my direction. And that's that's also something that happens on an individual level. Right. You're like, oh, yeah, I've got, you know, this is my chart and I've got this period coming up that looks very unfortunate. And when I check back at when uh, precedent for this period has occurred, oh, it's been shitty every time. The question is then well, what do I do about this, right? And that's where, I guess you could say, that's where magic fits, right? That's where the long tradition of astrological, planetary, stellar, ritual, and magic fits in, right? Because if you validated that, okay, this is worth being concerned about, then how do I shape it? Or how do I, you know, how do I get the bomb to land 10 feet further away, <laughs> right? Or how do I make it get that guy rather than me? That's interesting to me. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. For some, I was listening, I was actually listening to you talk to Chris Knowles a couple of weeks ago. I went on a Chris Knowles rampage, you know, <laughs> so like nine hours of stuff in three days, <laughs> which by the way is a, is a mind altering experience. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about, so what do you do, right? So if you know that there's there's an omen coming down or that the planets are configured in such a way that there's an outcome that you don't like that is high probability for you. And so it made me think back to what the model for divine kingship is. This is especially apparent in old Mesopotamia. You can definitely see it in traditional China and you can and Egypt and a lot of other places. The whoever the regent or sovereign was it was often explicitly their job to mediate heaven and earth, right? It was their job. That's where you get the mandate of heaven from. You know, it was explicitly their job to see what was happening and then try to shape that in such a way that it was favorable for the kingdom, right? It's actually that royal obsession with mediating between heaven and earth that astrology comes out of. The cycles of the planets were plotted for the first time that we know of in an accurate manner because of a multi-hundred year Babylonian astronomical research project. And these were not scientists who were off at the academy, um, you know, funded by the state, but not necessarily directly answerable to it. These are the king's astrologer astronomers, mm -hmm. right? And he's like, I need to know when this shit's going to happen, <laughs> right? Right. And because it matters, because it matters to me and it matters to the kingdom. And I think you can see this particular, the, the, the preoccupation of the elite layer with the heavens and mediating the heavens to earth even more explicitly in Tang era China. There's a wonderful book on the astronomy and astrology of Tang era China called Pacing the Void. And in an early chapter, the author reproduces a number of legal documents from that period showing that it was actually illegal for people who were not in the employ of the emperor to study astrology because that was his. Hmm. The ability to know that and to take those into consideration and to shape things in accordance with that was his, like that was his divine right and it was very explicitly not your right. I love a story like that because just hearing that is an indication that astrology has real value. Yeah, yeah, that's for me. And just to to jump to the 20th century, if you look at the Nazis as they were taking power in Germany, we know that the inner circle was all about some astrology and some magic. That was not promoted as a culturally, you know, that was not culturally promoted. They cracked down on groups who were not them. They tried to make sure that nobody else had that, right? Right, a monopoly. And so it's interesting because you have 
you do have a, cause I remember I've thought back on our discussion, our first discussion, which was about astrology and the elite. And I was thinking about that very much from the astrologer's perspective at that, during that conversation, which is not an inappropriate <laughs> perspective, right? Yeah. But from an elite perspective, you do have this pattern of trying to take that power for yourself and actively either making it illegal or even better, delegitimizing it in the culture at large, right? So that's for you. That's for you. It's not for them. It's not for the people. And that was an interesting pattern to revisit, right? It's interesting to think of it from that end. And, you know, even one of the most famous examples of an astrologer and somebody who had a lot of power was John D. and Elizabeth, right? You know, it was illegal to calculate birth charts at that time in England. <laughs> it wasn't like everyone was like, oh, cool, the queen has an awesome astrologer. I bet he's great. I wish I could get a reading with him. You know, that was an illegal thing. There were aspects of astrology that you could look at. You could look at like what it said about the weather and planting, but you weren't allowed to like get into the juicy stuff. So I've been thinking about that and I started thinking about astrological magic because that is, in a sense, the way that you mediate heaven and earth, right? You're like, ooh, Mars is in a really strong position. What if I pointed that over there rather than over here, right? Because if we're talking about that mediation, there's the protective aspect of that. Like, ooh, I want to make sure that I get through this okay. But then there's also the sort of active directing angle on it, right? Right. Like the energy still has to be satisfied somehow. So if you don't want to satisfy it because it's a negative force, then you got to give it something. Exactly. And it's more of the, the proactive side of it. And so the Bible of astrological magic is undisputedly the Picatrix, right? And I'm, I think we've talked about the Picatrix before. For those who aren't familiar with it, the, the Picatrix is. Actually, it's probably called the Gaia al-Hakim. It's sort of the big book of astrological magic. And it was written at some time in the 11th century AD in a city called Haran, which no longer exists. Haran is basically right now where the border of Turkey and Syria is. And the Picatrix, like many of the, the magic books from back in the day, is a combination of excerpts from a number of different texts with commentary, right? there, are, I believe the author claims that there are over 200 books that he's referenced. And, you know, if you think about, it's difficult to fill a library with 200 volumes that are actually useful on a particular topic now, even, you know, with the internets and all that. And so he was going to distill all this down for you. He's like, you're never going to own all these books. But so here's the best bits. Here's the logic behind it, right? And that got translated into Latin and ended up being an infamous grimoire during the medieval, especially Renaissance periods in Europe. Now, so, you know, the Picatrix contains things that an individual can do, like how to make a magic ring of Saturn that'll make old people like you and will help you live a long time, et cetera, et cetera, right? But if we look at where is it coming, what tradition is it coming out of? Because it, it wasn't that one man had the honor, excuse me, the author is anonymous, by the way. And it's not like one guy was just like, oh, I've got a great idea for a book and just, you know, wrote all this down. You know, he's putting together and framing pre-existent material. So let's think about where, where that is. So that's Haran. So Haran was at that point one of the only places in the Mesopotamian region where the old school Babylonian gods and worship and whatnot were still happening. It said that they, they celebrated the annual death of Tammuz or Demuzi every year up into the 11th century. This was a city of people. This is also the, the Temple of the Moon was still standing at this point. And this was a city that we know actively paid, we could call a heretic tax, through several different caliphs or, or caliphates. Part of the way that that caliphate structure worked is it wasn't all convert or die. It was if you're doing something which can be connected to how Islam was conceptualized at that point, like you were following this prophet who preceded Muhammad and isn't as good, but it's still like in the lineage, 
you were allowed to to be there and whatnot, but you could pay basically a heretic tax. And so the people of Haran said, okay, well, our prophet is Hermes, Trius Magistus, who is like this Old Testament prophet. So technically we're still in the same stream. So we're fine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we know this is all documented. This isn't, you know, hearsay or whatever. It's kind of amazing, right? It sounds like a wild conspiracy theory, <laughs> like the city of Hermeticis, where they're still celebrating old Mesopotamian gods. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love it because that seems to be the thing with references in Super Bowl halftime shows and Grammy Awards and just all the things we see. And of course, the main rituals we see out there. It's really Chris who's opened my eyes to it's all back to Babylon. I mean... We got Bloomberg opening a temple to Mithras in London. Like, why are you putting your energy into that? You're a, a billionaire who's got their hand in so many pies, but your emphasis is on some old Babylonian shit that doesn't even really register. You should care. And it's just strange how many things go back to that time period. So the city of Haran kind of uh, standing alone as an example of carrying these traditions on at a time, at an era where no one else was and just paying for the ability to do it. It kind of speaks to this is powerful shit. You want to take a little tax from me? Sure, I'll pay it because this is way more valuable than those fiat notes that you're requesting. Sure, you can have those. Exactly. Well, and anyway, so you think of it's like, what is the lineage of planetary magic? It goes back to the old Mesopotamian divine kingship thing. It's literally the only place where that's surviving at that period of, of time. And so it gave me a, a new angle on astrological magic. I was like, oh, in a sense, this is very much a miniaturization, an individualization or a min and therefore a miniaturization of what was, you know, what was originally royal power. No, that's the method, right? Is point the heavens where you want them, you know, <laughs> point the red eye of Mars at your enemies, not your friends. Yeah. And so that's also interesting to me because that's that's where Egyptian magic comes from. It's literally stolen out of the pyramids during the first intermediate period. It starts as a royal power technology and then during periods of disruption or instability individuals steal it. And that's actually one of the sort of big streams that contributes to the emergence of hermeticism is priests without temples miniaturizing what they were doing down to an individual level. And that that feeds into hermeticism, which is, you know, one of the, the few great currents in magic. And so listening to Chris really got me going. It gave me a different perspective on what I already knew. You know, these pieces were there to put together. So we have astrological magic as being a miniaturization of the king's power to mediate heaven and earth, right? Now, what's really interesting about this and the way that it connects, I think, to what Chris is seeing is that if we look at what is the method, you know, how do you do this stuff, right? Right. Picatrix is, is interesting and stands out and stands in distinction to a lot of the grimoires because it's not about names and it's not about like crazy looking sigils. There's a little bit of that. It's almost entirely image magic. You attract um, the heaven's power down to earth by creating particular images that correspond to what's above. And so the primary language, 85% of it is images. And so it's like, oh, if you want to do a sun thing, you know, cut into this stone, the image of a woman whose head is shining and she has a mirror in one hand and there are horses racing before her, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't have a, you don't have a sigil, you don't have a glyph and you don't have a name. And some of these images are recognizable. You know, if you've got the knowledge, you're like, oh, that's actually Hercules. Or you're like, oh, that's actually this North African goddess. But what's interesting is you don't need to know the name for the image to do its work, which is kind of striking and powerful in some ways, right? Because magic, when people talk about magic, even magicians, but, you know, especially when you see it in movies or whatever or stories, it's all about names of power, right? Names and, and like crazy seals. 
And that's certainly a portion of magic. But then there's this other whole branch, and this is specifically the astrological, stellar, and planetary branch, which focuses on images, right? And so now, now look at the patterns that Chris is investigating and pointing out. And it's like, oh, all you have to do is have the image, right? All you have to do is have the story, have the image. You don't necessarily need to name it, you know, the, you don't need to name that character in that show after some ancient Babylonian thing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be Shamash or Marduk, <laughs> right? <laughs> Like if you have the image, you know, the images do the work. They attract those intelligent, those celestial intelligences. That makes sense. I mean, that is why I guess you would have Katy Perry riding in on a flaming lion. Like, let's just put that image out there. And then I guess it's just hard to figure out what to do with it or how you channel it. I guess you put it on everybody's TV screen and deflect all the negative energy to the people watching. I don't know. Yeah, this has all been... A very recent set of thoughts for me. When I read Chris's stuff, I'm like, mm, okay, that's shaped like a spell. Yeah. That's great. But what is the point of the spell? Right? There's no, you know, Chris does a, a wonderful job with sort of doing a, a post mortem on a ritual site, be like, okay, yep, this is a ritual circle. Okay. It seems like these are the symbols. But then, you know, immediately I'm like, okay, well, what was the intention? Yes. Right? Because you, you don't have spells without intention. Exactly. And that's the hardest part to figure out because we're not in the club. Right. Right. Although, you know, we do have, it seems that we do have access to some of the same technologies that some people in the club utilize. Like, are you talking about grimoires and the Picatrix? Yeah. If they're looking at astrology and then timing ritual or, you know, spectacle in order to, should we say, manage history. That's the way I've been thinking about it. Like you're trying to manage, you know, because if you're in control, if you're in control, you'd rather like to stay that way, right? Nobody likes to lose power, especially people who are <laughs> most notable for their desire for power, right? And so how do you, how do you manage history, right? You know, in one country or several, so as to maintain your position. Right. So I think we can assume that that's probably the motive, right, is managing this period of history. And that sort of comes back to a question I had before I got into connecting, uh, thinking about the roots of astrological magic. And on a larger time scale than just this year, we're at, a, and this is something we've talked about before, we're at this period where there's a changeover in a 200-ish year cycle. The primary method for doing the astrology of history is the cycle of Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions. And they, and that, that's been the case since at least 8900 eight, AD, probably has earlier Persian roots, but you can see it in Abu Mashar on the Great Revolutions. But what's fun about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions is they occur every 20 years, and then after a set of about 10, they occur in a set of signs of a different element. So you get roughly 200 years of Earth, then 200 years of air, you know, and then and it proceeds through the elements that way. And when you examine history through this lens, you see really consistent and interesting patterns. When people think about astrology and history and big cycles, a lot of the time, you know, the go to the only thing people have heard of is the age of Aquarius, right, or the age of Pisces. And these are these 2,160 year periods. They're super long. And when we look at history through that lens, we can see those symbols rather explicitly on a religious level. The age of Pisces begins and the cult of the fish savior, Jesus, ends up being a big deal, right? right? The previous 2,000-ish years, it's the ram, check. Previous 2,000-ish years, it's the bull, check, right? And so that cycle, that very long cycle, seems to tell us a lot about religious symbols and formula for a period of time, but that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about power and politics, right, and money. Whereas the Jupiter-Saturn cycle, which is much smaller, seems to be explicitly geared towards the way that things are politically and economically organized. And so right now, we're a couple years before that changes over. We're at the end 
of a period that officially began in 1802. And so this has been the Earth cycle. And certainly, if we think about what Earth means the last 200 and almost 20 years, I have certainly been focused on that. One, you know, everybody's trying to own the land, own the resources. Also, all of our industrial revolutions have happened during this period. Also, materialism became a dominant way of approaching the world, right? The, the, the Earth thing is pretty self-explanatory <laughs> when you think about mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. right? So the, the next Jupiter-Saturn conjunction is at the end of 2020, and it's in Aquarius, which is an air sign. People get tripped up on, well, isn't Aquarius a water sign? It's the water bearer. No, it's an air sign. Think of it as clouds are water bearers, but are gaseous. That's like a quick mnemonic. That is, by the way, not the beginning of the age of Aquarius. That's an entirely different cycle. But it does begin the 200-year air cycle. This is something I'm, I'm still working on and putting together research and getting ready to write up. So if we have a cycle like this and it's small enough that we can look at precedents, then we can get an idea of what it might look like, right? We can't get a precedent for the age of Aquarius because, <laughs> you know, that was like... 25,000 years ago, right? We don't have a lot of data from them. But if we look at the air cycle, we can basically go back about 800 years, a couple times. So last time the air cycle began was almost exactly when Genghis Khan sets out to conquer everything. Oh, no. All right. So 800 years before that, we're about 400 AD, right? This is right before Western Rome ends up basically falling apart. And then if we go to the previous air cycle, it's when Alexander the Great poised to totally break up the Persian Empire. And so what's really interesting is that all three of these seem to privilege disruptive conquerors rather than sort of conquer and hold type of patterns, right? So Genghis Khan, biggest land empire on earth, that business breaks up very quickly after his death. What's interesting is it ends up being establishing a lot of trade networks. And that's interesting to me because that's exactly what Alexander's conquest did. Alexander's conquest, I don't think his empire made it a year after his death. <laughs> yeah. It's broken up immediately. But that ends up laying the framework for the Hellenistic world where you have, you know, people in Babylon talking to people in Alexandria, talking to people in Athens. And also with the, uh, if you look at the fall of the Western Roman Empire, that's also disruptive. It's not like the Gauls came in and they're like, now we own Rome and we're going to hold it for 300 years, right? Well, it's not that kind of conquer and hold sort of pattern. And what you have in every case is a disruptive conquest that then lays the, the groundwork for a more multipolar trade oriented thing. Hmm. Which is interesting in and of itself, right? Yeah, it's interesting, but it's kind of hard to conceptualize in our globalist system where I don't know where new trade networks would emerge. Well, right. So this is interesting. And, and this is where in order to understand where we're at, we need to zoom in a little bit. Because if, you know, if we're looking back at history and you know, you're like, oh, this 200 year thing happened five years before Genghis Khan. If you're watching it at the time, you don't know the cons coming. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's hard to see those big patterns. It's hard to see those big patterns so up close. So here's a there's a little technical note that we have to get through in order to have this discussion at the highest level. So there are actually two different ways of measuring when the cycle switches over. One of them, which is the one that happens in 220, is the apparent conjunction. And what I mean by apparent is like you'll be able to look up in the sky and be like, yeah, Jupiter and Saturn are super close together, right? Now, the other way that this is reckoned is by the mean conjunction, which is based on the mean speeds of these planets. So one is a mathematically idealized version and one is that you can see it in the sky, right? And so a lot of times these are exactly on track, but sometimes they'll be off and you'll have a 20 year gap before they sync up. So according to the mean conjunction cycle, we entered the 200 plus years of error in 2000. 
Whereas according to the apparent, it doesn't happen until a couple years, right? And so the implication in a sense is that the future already started. We just can't see it very clearly yet because it hasn't happened on an apparent level. Wow. See, that's really interesting because I recently had Gordon on as a guest and you haven't heard it because it hasn't gone up yet. But we talked a lot about Charles Fort and his dominance theory. Like he had these eras of dominance where the first one was the dominant of religion. And then we had the dominant of science. And then he predicted we would enter the dominant of wider inclusion, where all those Fortean tales that people just dismiss would actually start to be folded in to our worldview. And Gordon also calls it the dominant of witchcraft because it's a similar idea. These fringe paranormal types of things that people just can't wrap their head around, they're going to be integrated into the sciences. Like just one example would be the scientists from CERN came out with some announcement fairly recently that based on their calculations, the universe shouldn't exist. Well, clearly the universe exists. Maybe you should change your shitty model. And so we're seeing the breakdown of the dominant of science. We're like right in it. And that kind of goes right in line with this idea of a new era. And especially if it's going to be symbolized by air, that would be the symbol that I would point to for a lot of the weird fringe paranormal types of things that I would want to see folded in. Yeah, well, and so one of the things that's hopeful about the air periods, right? Because I just talked about King Khan murdering everybody and, you know, <laughs> in the fall of Rome. It is funny, of course, that the fall of Western Rome does coincide, you know, with the astrology because people have been wanting to use that as a way of thinking or as a way of being scared about the United States' position. So it is a little bit delightful that that lines up. Right. But anyway, we could say that that's negative. But as far as positive things, the air cycle is fantastic for language and new systems of thought. We have that every time. I mean, good Lord, the Hellenist, that Hellenistic period was such a, a ferment of new and glorious ideas. Not, 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 here's the thing. They're not, they're new, but they're made of the old, right? Like new synthesis that has to be the result of multiple cultural systems intersecting. Right. You know, Alexander's conquest connected the cultural spheres of Mesopotamia, Egypt and Greece in an unprecedented way. Right. You got to get some new stuff out of that. Like if all the thinkers during that time start talking, you get new stuff. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of new stuff, we do have these whispers. I mean, this might be a quite literal interpretation, but the Pentagon for the first time came out and said, yeah, there are UFOs and we're looking into it. We got this weird Tom DeLong chapter where he's saying, oh, all these technologies, they're going to be emerging from the deep state. They're coming out from the basement. And we might be seeing literal air technologies. I mean, maybe that's too much, but that's what I'm thinking. I mean, you know, that's the, the funny thing about astrology is sometimes it's obnoxiously literal. Where it's like, oh, it's the air period and we're looking at things in the air. I get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times it's a little bit more nuanced, but, you know, more often than is comfortable, it's obnoxiously literal, you know, like with the eclipses, right? You know, thinking about the culture and this and that, and it's literally just like everything's on fire. Oh, but anyway, so there was a point that I wanted to get to about that mean conjunction happening in 2000, even though the apparent conjunction doesn't happen for a few years. 2020, right? Yeah, it's the end of 2020. Cool. If we're looking for disruptive conquerors that unite, at least in the case of Genghis and, uh, and Alexander. Alexander. Yeah, like kind of unite the or conquer the known world, right? Because, you know, as far as Alexander was concerned, he conquered almost the entire world, right? <laughs> what if that was the internet this time? Ah. What if that was the disruptive conqueror? What if it wasn't a dude? It could be. It's an influence. Yeah. I mean, as far as like conquering and then setting up trade and information networks, which is the pattern from before, the internet kind of did that. Well, what about cryptocurrencies in terms of new trade routes or something that is parallel to that? Yeah, well, I, what I would say is that if we assume that some part of this cycle starts on the mean conjunction and then the other part of it starts on the apparent conjunction, 
you know, we're, we're at the end of this 20 years, which is between eras, right? Where we're, and I would say that we're, because the apparent conjunction in 2000 was in Earth, right? So if we postulate that the apparent conjunction is how people are thinking about things and the mean conjunction is sort of what's actually happening, you know, we've been sort of bringing or collectively we've been bringing this like the same set of assumptions and ideas that we've been working on for 200 years to a period of time that's actually past that. Yes. And so the apparent conjunction in 2020 would be us catching up to where things are. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's it's nice. You don't have to stretch the symbols very hard to get there. Like it, it's happened, but we can't see it yet. And so that's where, you know, as we get closer to that 2020, it, we get closer to be like, oh, yeah, this is where we are. This is what we should do based on that. But anyway, so this is uh, this is something I've been thinking about for a while. And I was asking myself, OK, so if I am a person in an elite position of power and I have access to some pretty decent astrology, then this is something that I would know about. And I would be like, ooh, this is a really big transition. When there are transitions, people who are in power lose power, and people who didn't have power get power, right? The danger to established power is very great during tumultuous periods, right? So if I'm in power, how do I manage this period for my benefit? That's the question, right? And that's sort of the part of the angle I was bringing to the patterns that Chris has done such a good job of observing. Because that's got to be the goal, is managing a transition period so that you get to retain your position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they seem to love this divine kingship model. I, I think that's pretty apparent. <laughs> if you look at, <laughs> you know, Mithras, that's what Mithras is. If you look at the Mithraic mysteries, it's all like the mastery of the spheres and self-divinization and obtaining kingship. Well, it is interesting, not that presidents are the real power, but the two presidents we've had since the Bean Conjunction in 2000 have had zero experience. That's a good point. <laughs> I mean, that's rare, right? I, I think for, for the most part. I mean, even Reagan was a major governor before he was president. Yeah. And so was Clinton, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a I hadn't considered that. That's really interesting. So that's a lot of big picture stuff. And that's an important framing for this year. Fair. And I, I love this type of subject. And it might sound fairly cerebral or conceptual to people who are listening. What would you point to in world events as the sort of astrological management attempts that we're talking about? Hmm, that's a good question. Certainly, the formula and symbols for divine kingship are being trotted out seemingly more visibly these days than in a while the <laughs> the big mithras statue <laughs> uh, is a pretty good example I, I would say chris knowles has done a really good job of showing all of the the lion symbols right with uh, the beauty and the beast and mithras he has a delightful piece called it's beginning to look a lot like mithras Right. Yeah. Those and also connecting that with the image of of Babylon, not the place, but Crowley's vision of a, of the goddess. These are all both kingship symbols, and in the case of Babylon, that's an image of a transition between eons or a transition between dominance. You could put it that way. And so, to a certain degree, that's a, a doubling down or a speeding up of the mobilization of kingship or sovereignty formulas. So I guess we could say that that's sort of a shoring up power sort of formula. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what to make of the mermaid thing. Well, let me step in because I just actually had thought about this and I thought it was fairly relevant. Yeah, shoot. So we talked about Saturn moving from Sagittarius to Capricorn. And how big a deal that is and the influence that Saturn has. Well, what is Capricorn? It is a mergoat. It's a goat-headed mermaid, basically. It's a fish-tailed goat. That's true. I think you could make a connection there. That's interesting. And, you know, actually, 
So what's interesting is in most contemporary astrological texts, you'll read about Saturn in a very earthy, concrete way, that it's about concretization and about form and density and weight. And it certainly is those things. But if you look at any traditional text, what you'll find is that Saturn consistently has significations for death by drowning. Mm. Or if it's like the ruler of the house of profession, that you will work in a seaside profession, like, you know, gut and fish or whatever. But yeah, the death by drowning, it's there over and over and over and over again. That's really interesting. I, I hadn't, I don't, know, I don't know. I think that's, that's actually not bad. I'm learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> another, you know, another thing about the mermaid or siren motif is, I don't know, it's in some ways, it's a very classical, like, it's almost, it's the song of the opiate of the people. It's just like, you know, come beneath the waves, right? Obviously, you don't drown. You're not lured into the waves and drown if you're aware. You just start swimming right? <laughs> you know, there's a luring, there's a luring a person into a place where they don't have any power. And so, you know, I think one, one thing we could say is it is the formula for opiating the peoples, <laughs> but I don't know that I have any greater insight into it than that. I think it's interesting. I think it's worth noting. Yeah. And I did want to talk more about that Saturn moving from Sagittarius to Capricorn, because it's one of the things in my preparation that I really dug into. And it seems super important because Saturn rules Capricorn, so its influence should be heightened. And I guess these things happen in three-year periods, at least when Saturn moves from sign to sign. What do you think this looks like for the next three years? Because it also coincides right with that 200-year cycle of Jupiter and Saturn being conjunct. So this seems like a double stacking of change that would occur three years from now, 2020. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, and this is interesting. This is the last time we'll have Saturn in an Earth sign during the 220 year, 200 to 220 year Earth cycle. You know, it is in a sense a doubling down on what we've been doing, but it, it's also going to serve as a retrospective for a very complicated pair of centuries. And this retrospective quality and when I say retrospective, it's sort of retrospective while we're still doing it, right? It's sort of like, oh, this is really, really, really not working, right? Because <laughs> that's how on a collective level, people generally don't adapt until the old pattern has become a total disaster, right? <laughs> Agreed. And so this is, I mean, it's interesting. This is the count. This is a closing out of a very long cycle. This is a cycle that began with Napoleon's conquest, same year, for land empire, right? It's the Earth cycle. <laughs> this is the the beginning of the end. And, you know, to match to match it to Gordon's thinking and the way he phrases things, like this is the apocalypse, right? <laughs> this is the end. This is the end of a particular pattern. So what's interesting is not only do we have that sort of framing, but we also have the fact that Pluto is in Capricorn. And so Saturn and we have Saturn and Pluto getting ready for a conjunction in Capricorn. And so that's another like Pluto, without getting too far into it, is very much in old patterns, things that need to go death and rebirth sort of thing. It brings that theming to whatever planet it connects with. And so in a sense, that's a doubling down on the same thing, right? At the same like end of an era, fin de, how do you say it? Fin de secle, you know, that, that end times <laughs> right on. Um, sort of quality. And then not this year, not 2018, but in 2019, we're also going to have eclipses on top of Saturn and Pluto. And in particular, it will be the dragon's tail side of the eclipses, which is also about the past and processing poison and letting go of stuff. And so there, there's definitely a symbolic overload in that direction for the next couple of years. Hmm. Man. And I guess I would ask you, when people are looking at these configurations we're talking about and looking at their own chart, is there something that is universal that listeners, you know, with all kinds of different charts could do to 
kind of measure the potency of certain things? Like if Saturn is going into Capricorn and it sounds like it might be a negative type of thing, but you have Saturn in Capricorn in your own chart, does it affect you differently than it affects other people? Absolutely. Absolutely. One way to think about it is the configuration of the, the planets now, like in the sky, is the weather, right? And then your chart is where you are, right? So if there is, for example, a hurricane in Louisiana, but I live in Oregon, then a hurricane still occurred, but it's not as big a deal to me as if I lived in Louisiana, right? Right. Same as if it started raining gold coins from the sky, right? Because some of these <laughs> some of these are good things. It's not all gnarly, right? Did it rain gold coins in Chicago, but I live in New York, right? And so on a very simple level, if you have a transit like Saturn in Capricorn and you have your sun in Capricorn, then that's targeting you directly. You're going to encounter those themes in a very literal way. Whereas, you know, if your sun's in, oh, I don't know, let's say Virgo, then that's not going to be the same level of intensity. You know, there are literally like five or six other filters that I would use, um, but I can't explain those. I, I can't teach those right now. But uh, the very simplest thing is if you've got a planet there, then expect to experience those themes very directly. Gotcha. So like it, the energy and the themes are somewhat consistent, but the potency is going to relate to your chart. Exactly. Cool. You'll be able to cool. see it on the news, but whether you see it in your life or just in the news is the is the difference. Gotcha. I was just curious because a person could interpret that to mean it would have a different meaning for me than everyone else. But it, at least it's a little bit simpler to understand if you can say the themes are static. It's just the energetic effect, I guess. Yeah. Well, so for example... So what'd you say? Uh, your birthday is March 25th, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, that means that you have your sun in the first decan of Aries. And so Saturn in Capricorn will be in the first decan of Capricorn. And so that that's a 90 degree angle relationship to your sun. And so, you know, we would say, oh, okay, so what is, what is that going to look like for Greg this year? Well, that's going to be that there's going to be a, a relatively heavy pressure to consolidate things, to get things stable, solid, be more disciplined, to kind of grow up with the sun, with the way that you present yourself. That's not a criticism, by the way. I'm just delineating. Oh, um, but it, like when, when you get a Saturn transit, it's cranky grandpa telling you to grow up and get your shit together, right? It's like, well, you've got this show. Well, why aren't you doing this with it? Have you checked your foundations? How could you make that more solid? And so generally people experience that as a period of more, there's like more pressure. It's grown up pressure. And again, it's cranky grandpa yelling at you for a while. And a lot of times that can be really positive, right? You know, it's good to have to look at how you're using your time, whether you could work smarter and or harder, yeah. right? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes that, that Saturn pressure pushes us to update to where we actually are in life. You know, it's really easy to like, say a person is in their early 40s, right? But they kind of haven't updated their program since they were 36. And then, you know, there's Saturn, Saturn transits can lead you to kind of wake up and be like, hold on, I'm not in my mid 30s anymore. I'm in my early 40s and things are a little bit different. Maybe it's recognizing that, huh, I don't need to, to fight for recognition. Maybe I've actually established myself. And so I can adjust to where I actually am. That makes sense. And this is a great thing to kind of end on because with so many people listening with so many different configurations, it's hard to talk about things in a blanket sense. But if they know just those couple of things about how to relate it to their own chart and they want to go and do that, I think that's pretty helpful. Yeah, I mean, everybody's going to get pushed to grow up in different ways and in different areas of their life. Fair. I think that's fine. Well, you know, we're not in a period where we're being led by adults who have our best interests at heart. You know, it's sort of kind of feels like it's on us during this period, you know, as as citizens of history and, you know, as the, the sovereigns of our own lives to just take everything that we can in hand and do what we can with it, you know, make, make good 
as far as we can. I don't I don't think salvation's coming from the sky or from the powers that be. <laughs> I don't think it ever does, but yet people fall into that trap time and time again. Wow. Well, fascinating stuff, man. I loved it. I hope people appreciate the value in this, complex as it can be. I think there is a reason the ancients followed the sky so much. Then when the real top-down control rolled out, I guess that's when it was all stripped away. So let's work to reclaim some of that knowledge, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people talk about believing in astrology or not. Just learn, a, like, look at what it says and to what degree it maps or does not map to reality, right? You can investigate something without believing in it. You know, draw your own conclusions. Agreed. Well said. Man, good times, Austin. If people got the astrology bug and they want to get more from you, what do they do? Well, they can go to my website. It's just my name, austincopic.com, and Copic is C-O-P-P-O-C-K. I wrote a very extensive walkthrough of the astrology of this year with big themes and then broken down into quarters. I also wrote a really long Saturn and Capricorn piece, if you want to sit down and read through that. I do do personal consultations. I'm booked out a ways, so <laughs> it's about four months right now. And I teach classes. I should be announcing my 2018 class schedule here in the next week or so. So by the time February rolls around. Beautiful. Well, thanks again, man. Always insightful. Good stuff on the horizon. Take care of yourself and stay warm in this three-year winter. <laughs> you too, man. You too. Boom goes the dynamite people, the higher side hat trick of synergistic shows. Austin Kopic did a great job, but I really do just love how Chris, Gordon, and Austin all sort of interlace to make one long six-hour magical extravaganza. Because it does seem like much of what Gordon and Chris talked about is also reflected in what Austin sees in the stars. And I'm learning a lot more. I'm recognizing cycles a lot more. And the more often some of them are referenced, the easier they are for me to get a flavor for. But just in the time since recording this, Austin has sent me two news items about powerful people being slapped down by judgment. And it is an exciting proposition that this would be happening a lot over the next three years. Bring that on. But it might also destroy the country. So I hope you're ready for that, too. Lots of people have been talking about the decline of the American empire. It's kind of a conspiracy motif, probably goes back to before I was born, but it seems to be heating up. And if that's what you might expect out of the next, say, five years, then we probably will see a lot of judgment and sacrificial lambs as everyone tries to lawyer up and deflect attention away from their own crimes. But between the ending of cycles we talked about today, recent news stories, that date of 2044 that Chris keeps picking up references for, and the dominant of wider inclusion dialogue with Gordon, I think there's a lot to chew on in terms of looking at the rest of our lives, or at least the next few decades. I think it was in the Plus show when I read from Austin's blog about the Uranus-Neptune-Pluto synchronization in 2025 which supposedly really divides the energy of the next decade. And Austin even said something to the effect that everything looks like it's going to get pretty sci-fi in 2025. So I just like the overall cohesiveness of all of this, and that the rituals and agendas we see seem to be pointing out into the future a few years. The materialist science atheism paradigm is looking more like Swiss cheese, and it all just really jives with what I smell in the air. Again, we're talking about the road to 2020, then a milestone in 2025, then up to that 2044-2045 transition. So we're not talking about anything overnight here. But what will the world look like when we get there? How invasive will these agendas that we're seeing now be then? Obviously, it's not crystal clear, but you can almost picture the Bilderberg whiteboard presentation for how these timelines match the material, right? So I hope you guys enjoyed the flow of these three episodes back-to-back -back like I did. I actually recorded another one before Austin, but I switched the order at the last minute just because I like how nicely they paired. Like fine wine, guys. But the next one is coming. It's a little more practical and down-to-earth. It's a deep dive into fascism with Shimanjanir. He wanted to take a break from that Elemental series to give us a little historical and philosophical lesson. 
about an ideology that definitely doesn't benefit us, but also never seems to really go away. It emerges in many different flavors. Really interesting, but a show that definitely stands apart for this month. But it's good to have something for the practical. That's what casting a wide net means. In terms of astrology, I also wish we got more out of the solar eclipse, or I wish that some drastic event was a better match for the intensity of the predictions and the uniqueness of the eclipse situation itself. But it is possible that there was a bait-and-switch, king-sacrifice type of play made, probably with Bannon, but I don't fully see it. Though I do like the overall idea that these energies are coming and you need to offer them something if you're in their way. That's the point of being knowledgeable. And the eclipse energy might still tie into something in our latest lunar eclipse cycle that's coming up. We still have time to see something that's a better match. But like Austin said, presidents in this time period, regardless of Trump's chart itself, have faced difficulty. Very serious difficulty. So be on the lookout. But kind of like what I was saying, it's also a really interesting idea to put yourself in difficult situations when the energy is going to be calling for it. I think there's a depth of magical understanding there that's a bit beyond the surface level and could also be thought about in the context of elite actions. Still though, if you see Mars and Saturn coming through, prepare for it with difficult activities that will improve your life. Why not? Start an exercise routine. That to me was the big lesson, that the energy's coming and you can channel it and this would be a practical example of how. I forgot what half it came out in, but, you know, that's the nature of the THC game here. Sign up for Plus, because, you know, you're only hearing half the conversation. I do a pretty good job of cutting them up so that the end of the first hour sounds natural and you don't even notice, but there's 60 minutes of added goodness, and I'm only asking for a dollar. Usually they've been a bit longer lately, too, so just a bonus. In this Plus show, we talked about Things like which world events support the timeline management hypothesis, the rare triple sync of 2025 and what it might manifest, getting a better understanding of what Saturnian influence truly means, also what to expect from the U.S. economy, the coming arrival of the two Maleficents, and the big question of, you know, if the elite see the astrological patterns on the horizon and work to manage them, how can we do the same in our own lives? And then, of course, more details about the 2018 forecast. Austin's been doing the 2018 forecast all over the damn place, so we both thought it'd be cooler to get into some more interesting and historical stuff and let the 2018 forecast kind of weave its way in and out. But yeah, some of the stuff I was just mentioning clearly was in the Plus show. So sign up for Plus or sign up for Patreon. Both get you access to the longer shows. And I'll see you next time. Again, big, big thanks to Austin. I've done what I can. Your move, planets. Literally, your fucking move. Lucid dreams are so vivid Cause you go to bed at seven And your brain comes alive Cause you hate your nine to five You wake up with a dread And make sure your cats are fed Did your brain talk to a ghost Who moved your coffee and your toast As you listen to the high side chats You get to your desk and your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows to a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around, you insert a steady sound The OM says turn it down and you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'd be invited to Bohemia Grove to a Bilderberg Club? Oh, do you think you'd be invited by a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down to the center of the earth Through the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench from the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down, and the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you, cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats (laughs) 